All right. Shalom and grace, everyone. Peace and love in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Thank you for clicking on another video. Israelite Theology Talk. We Israelites, we talk, and you know, we build. So, um, I was originally going to bring out some Ethiopian history today, but we ended up running into new information on the black Israelites or the black Jews, the um, Israelites in America, um, North America to be exact. So, last time we were talking about the Israelites, uh, we, we brought out information about Gabriel, who was um, a slave who, who found out that we were Israelites and he led a rebellion. Um, we found out about William Sanders Crowdy, even though I did not know that the, the group I was talking about was his group until after, so I edited the video and put his face in there um, because it was a bishop. But it's Church of God and Saints of Jesus Christ. Um, that was a group. He was also a former slave who came out and uh, started his organi organized Hebrew congregation. Um, and then after them, you have um, Ra uh, Rabbi Ford, who came from, um, who, who, who got his credentials from Ethiopia and started the Commandment Keepers. Um, and then when they left to go to Ethiopia and build a congregation there, uh, the mantle got passed to Rabbi Matthew. Um, so we're going to pick off from right there, um, see if it's anything that I left out. I don't think so. And if I did, I'll edit it in here somewhere. Um, but we're going to pick off right there with the commandment keepers. And that's how we did an overview of them and what they did in, in the uh, congregation, like the school and all of that. So we're going to bring out more history. So let's get it in. Today, my source is called African Zion Studies in Black Judaism. Um, this is a... I don't have this book yet, but I do plan on getting it as ASAP um, because it's got some crazy information in it. So, all praises to the Most High. Bashem Yahushua. So, let's read it. It says, this is uh, chapter 10. It says, Matthew also had a long and troubled relationship with New York's white Jews. So, this is um, something that we're going to be touching on today, the historical um, connection. Because um, Rabbi Matthew and the black Jews being so obscure to, to the Europeans around them, um, you know, them showing love to everybody kind of was, it's like they were being integrated because white Jews would see them and be like, oh, this is interesting. And then they would link up with them and, and learn and, and study and all of that. And they would grow and build and, and uh and, and rock with each other to a certain extent, which is crazy to hear because I know we it's a whole different story now, but that's in the history. Because in the institutional level, um, this communion would never be fulfilled because of um, pride and ego and greed. <laughs> Shout out to Yehuda Shalom. <laughs> pride, ego, and greed. But um, let's get it. It says, uh, let's see if we have anything. You had something called the Moorish Zionist Temple. Um, it was um, a, a thing called the Moorish Zionist Temple. And there were other Israelite movements. But a lot of these have faded away in the 30s. And the reason why they had faded away is because there was a man named Elder Robinson. I don't know what group he was in. But Elder Robinson, he had something called a, a baby farm or something uh, in violation of something called the Man Act M-A-N-N -N Act um, and this put the Israelites in a very bad light among the nations and um, from that point on European Jews had looked at black Jews as like either people who were curious or imposters um, but you know that does change in the coming years but before we get to that um, we're going to talk about these other groups and how they have fell away. Um, the dude who, who did the, um, the Morris, Noble Jew Ali, um, he actually came out of one of the black Jewish congregations. And then they went off to um, do the Morris Science Temple, which um, 
they they more in connection with the Canaanite line and the Moabite line and those ancient practices and sciences. Um, that's what they do. Let's see what else we can read up in here. It says, um, let's see, let's see. Okay, here we go. So, it says, there was a man named Rabbi Jacob who taught a messianic version of the unity of the Jewish people. A writer for the Works Progress Administration and Writers Program wrote, Rabbi Jacob is firm in the belief that a Jewish Messiah will one day arise to lead both black and white Jews back to Palestine, where Jerusalem will become the world's capital for the Jews, and they will be the ruling race. But there's an but the, despite the lack of formal institutional cooperation with white synagogues, there were much informal cooperation between black and white Jews in New York, like donations and, and things of that nature. So uh, the Moorish Zionist Temple and the Commandment Keepers both had interracial um, congregations. Not marriages, though. Uh, Rabbi uh, Matthew, he, he had forbid that in the commandment keepers, but they did have white Jews in their congregation. Um, it says they, he had about a, a dozen of them, but, you know, Ashkenazi stay Ashkenazis, and uh, the Negroes stay how they are, the Negro. Um, let's see. And, this la and that lasted until the 1960s. It says, um, let's see, the concern for world jewelry that the black Jews had showed during the 1930s and the 1940s improved their standing in the eyes of white Jews. Rabbi Matthew pledged his support to an anti-Nazi drive in 1934 saying in a prepared statement to a Jewish newspaper quote we have heard of the atrocities being committed against our brothers in Germany and we will not remain silent longer Matthew connected the fight against fascism abroad with the battle against racism at home stating we are fighting barbarism of all kinds on two fronts one is Hitler terror, and the other is the wave of lynching of colored folks that has swept the South. Interesting. So that's interesting, and they started cooperating at a different um, level, even to the, the point to where they had a concert, um, where it was like a bunch of uh, European Jews having a concert, and I think it was one um, Israelite Jew on the, on the stage uh, singing, and um, and that money, the proceeds went to actually get the building for the commandment keepers. Let's look at some more. So uh, the reformed Jews in New York, uh, they they wanted Matthew to try to get in with this with the this the group of the synagogues, the the Jewish think tank in a sense. But um, they didn't know that uh, you had to go through certain Orthodox Jewish traditions to be accepted. And they did not accept the letter that uh, Rabbi Ford had got from Ethiopia, who um, gave them his legitimacy to be leader of the black Jews in America. It says, this is what Matthew has said. We must be accepted by the white Jewish community as a part of the children of Israel on an equal basis. So that's that was an older mindset that does change, however, because this continues to happen and the institutional cooperation continues to be denied because of pride, ego, and greed and not um, want to want racism, basically. So around 1960, uh, they get discouraged about the prospects of gaining equal footing in the uh, Jewish, in the white Jewish world. You know, um, he said, quote, we don't ask to be accepted by white Jews, end quote. Um, and whenever, he says, quote, whenever we made an attempt to become integrated, we hit a solid stone wall, end quote. 
So it says, um, it says, black Jews continue to be separate from the overwhelming majority of Jews in New York, still isolated on the fringe of New York Jewelry are the Falashim, or black Jews. A writer from the National Jewish Post and Opinion reported, participation in Jewish life is scant and intermingling with their white brethren is rare. Despite the enthusiasm and pride they express for their religion or their lifestyle, they do not get the recognition they feel is deserved. Nevertheless, he did not stop trying to gain recognition in a sense. Um, in 1961, the Commandment Keepers again attempted to gain membership in the B'na Barith. This time, Douglas Gibbs, a member of Matthew's synagogue, approached Abraham Livingston, who decided that the Commandment Keepers were a legitimate Jewish congregation and agreed to sponsor their application. Um, but the but Matthew was turned down because of racism. Um, and they tried to say that he wasn't a real rabbi. Even though we know that there's different traditions. Because based on where you born, you got Ashkenazi, Halakta. That's what they call it, Halakta. I think that's like your worship. And um, Ashkenazi, Sephardi, Mizrahi, um, Falashim. East Falashim, Ethiopian Jews, what about Western Falashim, perhaps? And it's it's so deeper. It's just deeper. And that's what we're going to be here to talk about. The the deeper matters that you're not going to hear anywhere else. Yahuwah will. And I mean, hopefully you do hear it somewhere else because we want this word to go out and we want true history to be told. Amen. So let's see what else we got. It says, the push to organize and serve black Jews that resulted in a New York City-based group called Hadzad Hirishan in 1964 came from white Zionist Jews and were supported by Zionist organizations to a much greater degree than it came from white religious Jews and white Jewish religious organizations. So there were some organizations that were created to help Israelite Jews get a footing, which is interesting. But we know whenever the European Jews try to integrate with you, they're trying to teach you their way of it. That's usually what they do in Africa today. They teach um, them to follow what they view as orthodox, which is how they view the Torah. And a lot of us is messianic as well. If you believe in Jesus Christ, Yeshua HaMashiach, a lot of them won't even believe that you was, then, then that nullifies your Israelite descent. So that's the come we start. Things like this is why we started doing our own thing. I do not think that we should hate them, but I do believe that we should be who we are. Amen. It says, um, by the mid 60s, Matthew and most other black Jewish leaders in New York had been thoroughly repelled by white Jewish institutions and were unwilling to cooperate with them. It was not always this way as we have seen. There were episodes of interracial cooperation going back to the 1920s, but white intransigence, I wanted to pronounce that word right. You can look that word up, intransigence. I'm going to look it up as well and I'm going to put the definition up here, you already know. It says, um, but the rise of a new generation of black nationalist, black Israelite groups also pulled black Israelite young people away from the Judaic identities and organizations into a new black Israelite orbit. New, bold black Israelite movements dominated the civil rights and the black power eras rejecting Judaic models or Israelite models. These movements often instituted highly patriarchal and masculinist social systems and frequently advocated immigration, whether to rural areas, areas in the U.S. or overseas. So uh, this is where we're kind of at 
now in the study. So after the 1960s, you have the new generation of, of, of Israel, where this group of Israelites are um, rejecting the, the old way in, a, in a favor of a new, bolder way, more masculine, as it says in here. You know, that's what they wrote. Um, masculine social system. Um, it says, but also it says, you know, the largest of these movements, so the largest of the new movements, we had broke that down in the last video as well. We went to um, Abba Bivens branch, which was the ISUPK, and all of those groups that sprang from there, the One West groups. But you also had other groups that sprang, um, and this is talking about the, what is this one? The original Hebrew Israelites in Chicago, um, who went to Liberia in 1967 and then settled in Dimona, Israel in 1969, where they remain to this day, to this day as well. And that's Ben Ami, um, Ben Ami's group. And you have his history there where they have a weird situation as well where they couldn't get citizenship and they, they might not still have citizenship, but what they do have to do in order to live there is put their kids to fight the uh, Ashkenazi's battles um, or, or, you know, battles for, for the land of Israel against the Palestinians. But, you know, that conflict is so crazy in itself. What can I say? But it is their home now. It says, uh, Matthew may have built a colony in Babylon, but newer black Israelite groups continue to search for their own Zions. So that's uh, that was that book, African Zion Studies in Black Judaism. Excellent. Um, the rest of the book, it talks about uh, uh, the history of African tribes and, and their Israelite heritage and um, things of that nature. Other Jews, other black Jews, like Limba, um, Beda Israel, and Ethiopia. Uh, it also has this cool story in there about this sister named uh, Paris who went to Ethiopia with Ford and they got a Torah and I guess somehow she was in Germany and she had to sneak it past the Nazis and uh, she brought it back to America uh, she didn't give it to the commandment keepers though she gave it to one of the offshoots but um, that's crazy or, or she may have gave it to Matthews but I don't think she did Unfortunately, um, and with that, man, I I think next time we'll go into um, some more Ethiopian history. But uh, before we go into that, we're gonna go back into the scriptures, and we're gonna bring out um, some stuff about the uh, the Ethiopian eunuch, which is the topic I want. Shalom, shalom. Okay, we back. My bad, but I actually forgot to mention something, and. Um, uh, about William Shroudy, uh, William Sanders Crowdy, um, his groups, the Church of God and Saints in Jesus Christ, from way, way back in the day, uh, who was a former slave who, who, who was an Israelite, and he had homies that was Israelites, and they built the body, and they still going to this day. Matter of fact, they be streaming on Facebook. I seen it, um, but they actually had a branch in South Africa, and uh, I posted this on Facebook. Uh, but I'm going to bring it up here so that this can be known, you know, more uh, aware. Um, but it was called uh, the, it was a massacre, uh, the Bullport Massacre, I believe. I'm going to have it up here. So if I said it wrong, it'll be corrected. Uh, my apologies if I'm wrong. But this group was connected to uh, William Sanders Crotty's group in America. And, um. They had stood their ground on their on their land in the Union of South Africa, which were uh, Europeans who were taking over South Africa, bought these people for their land, and it's crazy. And um, they believe that they were taken serious, and and it's a whole bunch of stuff that go with that. But research into that as well, um, that's crazy, and that's something that we should think about as Israelites and commemorate and remember those uh, martyrs, Israelite martyrs. And with that. I want to say uh, grace and peace, infinite blessings from on high, from the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Let's keep it pushing. Uh, Yahuwah willing all the way to the kingdom. May he give us grace to do um, the things that, you know, he allows us to do.
Bless y'all. Thanks for watching. Shalom.